So hello, my name is Erin Moran and I am the Clinic Partnership Manager here at the Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and thank you to our friends at Cherokee Health Systems for hosting today's session on Pediatric Sports evalu Physical Evaluation with Dr. Gerald Angoff. And with that, we can begin. Good afternoon, everybody. I think we're all on the same, same time zone, so. <clears throat> Um, good afternoon to you. My talk is the pediatric sports evaluation, and I've subtitled it Screening for Heart Disease. As I'll develop, the focus will be as, as these evaluations, I think, are intended primarily on heart disease. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest, and MAVEN is certifying this as a category one CME. <clears throat> My objectives for the talk. Uh, hopefully, <clears throat> you will, as takeaways, understand what cardiac conditions may pose a risk to increased activities and, and sports participation. Do you be able to use a validated assessment tool for such evaluations? And be able to provide some recommendations on return to activity after illnesses such as, as COVID, <clears throat> which um, over the pandemic and into recent times has been a concern. <clears throat> the outline for my talk, first a little bit about who I am, an overview of the sports physical examination or what is commonly called a pre-participation physical evaluation or, or physical exam to identify some of the heart disease that one might be concerned about in doing these evaluations, discuss tools for the evaluation, pitfalls and potholes, and talk a little bit about COVID and evaluation following infection and, <clears throat> and consideration for return to activity. <clears throat> then uh, summary and recommendations and questions. My background, I'm a clinical cardiologist, <clears throat> most recently in, in an academic setting at Dartmouth Hitchcock in New Hampshire. <clears throat> My practice has been both adult and pediatric cardiology with most recently a focus on adult congenital heart disease. <clears throat> I've also been a consultant in medical information and technology concentrating on process workflows <clears throat> and improved quality and outcomes. Some sort of a process guy, which you'll perhaps I garner from my talk. Okay, <clears throat> the overview of the evaluation, PPE. <clears throat> First, I'd like to ask some questions, kind of get an idea of, of how you folks, uh, how the subject touches you folks. Uh, for a first question, uh, do you perform pediatric sports screening evaluations? I'd like to get an idea for what relevancy this might have for your practice. <clears throat> do you feel comfortable performing these evaluations? Are you clear about what you're being asked to do, asked to evaluate? Do you have the tools for these evaluations? So maybe we can, uh, Aaron, maybe if you can invoke the poll, that, uh, see if we can get some sense from those attending. Okay. Yes, the poll looks like it is launched. We'll wait a few more minutes. We have a lot of participants um, putting some answers in. All right, I'm going to end. Oh, a couple more. <clears throat> I'm going to end the poll. And would you like me to share the results? Please. All right. The results are up. Oh, 
Okay, so <clears throat> many of you do these these um, exams, and <clears throat> we'll see uh, um, what you think about the relevancy of what I have to offer. Okay. Screening <clears throat> of young athletes. First, it's widely recommended and performed. And the American College of Cardiology and Medical, the American Heart Association have guidelines. Uh, though in practice, there are many different protocols or, or ways of doing these examinations. The definition of an athlete actually isn't, um, isn't uh, all that well accepted, it's highly variable, and, and that has some relevance. Elements of screening are history, physical examination, and uh, uh, the question about testing, relevancy, or to what help testing will be, I'll address. The purpose of the sports physical examination isn't as straightforward as one might think. First of all, the word clearance to participate is often used. But clearance for what? Is it for just school team sports? Uh, low level, high intensity? Is it only those participating on teams? <clears throat> and what about the non-athletes? If you screen athletes, should you also be screening non-athletes? That's almost an ethical question. <clears throat> Are you screening for prevention, the prevention of injury? <clears throat> is, it per, is it to identify unrecognized illness and for the purposes that I've defined, is it to avoid cardiac events? Is this a, a screening for heart disease? And then for the benefit of whom is the screening done? Is it the athlete? Is it their families? Is it the schools or institutions? Is it, is it the lawyers and liability that the screening is recommended and done? I mentioned that the definition of an athlete is variable. For the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, it's an individual who, who participates in, in competition with a high premium on excellence and requires some form of, of systematic and often intense training. <clears throat> but that's not universal. In an Israeli study, an athlete was with any individual engaged in the sport <clears throat> activities at any level of physical endurance. It makes a difference in terms of who you might end up screening or considering for screening. Well, what's the ultimate worry? <clears throat> missing a diagnosis? Is it malpractice? Uh, is it sudden cardiac death? <clears throat> this quotation from an article dating back to the, to the 1980s is still relevant. Cardiovascular disease in young athletes is usually unsuspected during life. And most athletes who die suddenly have experienced no cardiac symptoms. And only about 25% of those competitive athletes who die suddenly is an underlying cardiovascular disease detected or suspected before participation. And rarely is the correct clinical diagnosis made. <clears throat> Variations of, 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 of this theme I'll, I'll repeat during the study, during, the, uh, during this talk. Well, identifying heart disease. Just to specify what types of heart disease might pose a risk to physical activity. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, anomalous coronary artery origin, where a coronary actually comes <clears throat> is connected to the wrong place. This is a congenital heart abnormality. Arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. <clears throat> it's a cardiomyopathy uh, specifically involving right ventricular function. It's a genetic defect <clears throat> and it results in 
and can result in life-threatening arrhythmia. Long QT syndromes, ion channel defects, again, genetic. <clears throat> myocarditis, acute myocarditis is, is, uh, is present uh, at a given moment in time. Marfan syndrome poses a risk to those participating in activities at high levels. Really all are rare and easily missed with screening. And another part of this, this theme of caution. <clears throat> Even for children with chest pain, children and young adults with chest pain, <clears throat> is that symptom due to heart disease with any frequency? It's rare that heart disease is present in studies of thousands of, of, of young people presenting with chest pain, only about 0.1 or 0.2%. Tools for the evaluation. Um, we'll, we'll talk about some basic components, some forms and checklists. We're going to address testing and when to refer. Basic components. History. History is the most powerful tool in doing these sports evaluations. And in fact, history is the most powerful tool of any clinical encounter. If one looks at, at articles that, that, that quantitatively identify that, that component, history always comes out as, as being most helpful, despite all the technology that we have. Certainly physical examination can provide some clues. Uh, testing, does it help? Does it add to those history and physical examination elements? It's actually kind of controversial. An EKG is most commonly a test or testing tool. And what about others? Uh, in terms of forms and checklists, the American Heart Association has a list of 14 elements. The American Academy of Failing Physicians and Pediatrics have forms <clears throat> um, that are helpful and uh, I'll address briefly. Uh, you're going to get a copy of the presentation and I'll have references throughout there. These are all clickable um, citations which can take you to uh, the, the sources and to the forms. Uh, uh, directly. Uh, the American Heart Association recommends this four-point screening guidelines or the equivalent as a part of these evaluations. These are articles in 2014-2015. Screening with 12 lead EKGs, which uh, uh, I think many of you might consider just straightforward in a given. Um, in association with comprehensive history taking and physical examination may be concerned. It's not an absolute. And they state mandatory and universal mass screening with EKGs in a general population of healthy people is not recommended for athletes or non-athletes. Basically, the, the, the studies have not shown a benefit. Uh, here are those 14 elements. And it's primarily uh, history, personal history, any symptoms, any prior recognition of a heart murmur, hypertension, a prior restriction from participation in, in sports or testing ordered by a physician because of heart concern. Uh, family history, <clears throat> uh, sudden premature deaths, particularly sudden death, uh, in more than one relative before the age of 50, disability of heart disease, again, in young relatives. Uh, first degree relatives are, are, are really most significant. Uh, I received a consult about a concern of heart disease in a second cousin recently. Um, that's a little too far removed. First degree relatives are parents and siblings. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or, or dilated cardiomyopathy, long QT, Marfans. I've mentioned these conditions before those, those that were listed. Any history of those, those elements uh, in the family? 
Uh, physical um, examination. <clears throat> Excuse me, Dr. Angoff. Yes. Um, we're getting some feedback that there is an audio issue, um, and it seems that your volume is going on and off. So I just wanted um, our IT team to take a look really quickly. Sorry to interrupt you. Hi, Dr. Hi, Dr. Angoff. Can, um, first of all, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. You sound... Is this, is this any better? I don't, I can't, I can't compare to what I heard before. I hear you okay. Maybe it sounds a tiny bit fuzzy, but it seems okay right let now. Me change, let me change my audio source. Yeah, I, I was not having audio issues, but uh, we got some feedback that there was, it sounded like a low volume or it was going on and off. So I just want us to double check. <clears throat> Is this any better? Can you hear me? It does sound louder. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely hear you. But, um, I don't know, Aaron, do you want to have a continuous presentation for a little bit and see if uh, the yes. volume stays level? Yes, we're getting feedback that it does sound a lot louder now. Um, so... We're talking about the 14 elements. Is that better? Can you hear me better? Yeah, I think we're getting good comments that you're, you're yeah, everyone is, looks like they say they're hearing you better. Okay. For physical examination, uh, certainly the presence of a heart murmur. Don't forget about measuring or feeling for femoral pulses. Um, it's often that physical examination is kind of truncated these days. Um, you can make the diagnosis of, of a circulatory defect like aortic coarctation if their femoral pulses are absent. Certainly consider if Marfan syndrome is a possibility. Certainly detect, detecting um, you know, hypertension. This is an example of one of these uh, forms. This is the PPE form. It's available from this link down here. And it, the questions are very much the same as the, as the 14 elements of the American Heart Association. It's, and, it, and it concentrates again on history. Uh, the questions are almost the same. <clears throat> Testing. I mentioned it was a bit controversial. Uh, an EKG, it's, it's widely used, but a bit controversial, the degree to which it really changes the outcome. I mentioned those uh, references from the HAACC. An echocardiogram is mostly part of secondary testing, namely if heart disease is already suspected based on the initial screen. Likewise, um, ambulatory monitoring, halter monitoring, or long-term monitoring <clears throat> would be secondary only if there's a suspicion of arrhythmia. Exercise testing, again, secondary. It was a component in two in, um, international trials <clears throat> and it really wasn't helpful as a screen. So it should be second, secondary um, and to be considered if already disease is suspected. What about referral? If screening is abnormal, based on those, those screening tools, if an EKG when done is abnormal, uh, please be sure that when EKGs are done that the age is entered so the computer knows it's a child or, <clears throat> or a, um, a young person. Otherwise, the, the computer analysis will be off and, and an EKG interpretation may come back as being abnormal when it's normal for age. <clears throat> a pediatric cardiologist EKG interpretation is desirable if available. <clears throat> and I would suggest referring um, if you suspect heart disease, if any abnormalities are present, rather than <clears throat> undertake any additional testing on, on your own. 
Otherwise, you'll be going down a rabbit hole and perhaps won't know how to interpret those tests. Pitfalls and potholes are many. But first of all, cardiac disease in young athletes is rare, as I've already alluded to. <clears throat> the measure is sudden cardiac death. And for over a 26-year period, there are only, on average, 66 such events per year. And half of those, <clears throat> only about half of those are cardiac. And when these events occur, they usually show up in the local press. But this is a degree to which they actually are rare and actually due to heart disease. <clears throat> Screening was effective in only one study. And it was an Italian study, which was done in a community where it was, it was actually a, a, a high incidence of um, a genetic uh, defects, a high incidence of, high, of um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in that area, and that was uh, the the variance from the United States and <clears throat> studies in Israel. There was, the value of of an EKG in reducing mortality was certainly was disputed. It just didn't seem to make the difference. I think it makes people feel comfortable to get a test, but does it work? Uh, reference there um, below. More pit, pitfalls and potholes. Think of the large number of athletes to be screened nationally on an annual basis. It would be 10 to 12 million. <clears throat> There's actually a low incidence of events, as mentioned. You're really needle in the haystack searching. <clears throat> EKG testing has false positives and false negatives in the range of 5 to 20%. <clears throat> There's the cost, the resources involved, the expense, <clears throat> particularly considering um, that how few people, how few events actually occur. <clears throat> um, what about resources of physicians um, that can perform examinations and interpret those EKGs? Uh, the logistics about the secondary testing, if, if, if the screening is abnormal and, and perhaps even falsely abnormal, then all the secondary testing referrals. And <clears throat> again, the theme that of, uh, of caution, <clears throat> even with testing, screening cannot be expected to identify all athletes with important cardiovascular abnormalities. It, particularly given the significant false negative rate. It's really hard, even if one does one's best, even if one uses all of the tools and recommendations <clears throat> to find these folks. Uh, as examples, there are recent events, um, perhaps uh, football, um, uh, <clears throat> um, NF NFL uh, fans, I uh, remember this past year, a, a professional football player having cardiac arrest on national TV, <clears throat> and he was resuscitated on the field, and it was felt he probably had what's called commotio cortis, that he would just had a sharp blow to the chest <clears throat> in a vulnerable point in the cardiac cycle that caused his arrest. Then a high school professional basketball prospect who had a cardiac arrest practicing <clears throat> um, the cause was not specified, at least in the press, <clears throat> but he was allowed to resume play. Both were successfully resuscitated. <clears throat> and here's the point. Both had extensive cardiac evaluations to include advanced testing and imaging, cardiac testing and imaging, be <clears throat> uh, earlier in, in their um uh, their sports history and the testing was all normal. So these are examples of the inability to predict and prevent life-threatening events. And it's not a justification for more screening. What about post-COVID activity? Is it a special circumstance? Uh, here's a question for you folks. Um, uh, have you tested for COVID at any time over the course of the pandemic. For, for, for those attending, this is for you. If you could kind of answer yes or no. Yeah. 
can bring up the, the poll, Karen. Okay, great. That's helpful. Well, <clears throat> okay, so the, the point is <clears throat> that the great majority now have had COVID infections, symptomatic or not. It, <clears throat> and uh, that we're at a different point in consideration of COVID than we were a couple of years ago at the height of the of the pandemic. And of course, many have had multiple vaccinations. <clears throat> and additional cardiac screening space solely on having COVID does not make any sense at all at this point. <clears throat> so when to provide any further consideration? Uh, there were three scenarios for COVID heart disease, and this was particularly true during the peak of the epidemic, that uh, cardiac organ damage could occur during the acute illness. These were people who were hospitalized. It was a combination of, of acute viral injury, the immune response, and perhaps microvascular dysfunction, small blood vessel clots. Um, there was myocarditis and pericarditis following vaccination. Um, that seems to have diminished, or certainly people no longer detect it or 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 talk about it. It was primarily males more than 16 years old. And um, it um, occurred several days after vaccination and recovery appeared to be full and quick. So although it did occur, apparently not a long-term clinical problem. And then there was something called MIS-C. This was multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. It was similar to Kawasaki's and probably a delayed immune response, also followed by recovery. This led to a lot of the concern that people talked about in dealing with those who had had COVID and were to return to sports activity. So what about the guidelines and have they been helpful? Well, first they were developed early in the course of the pandemic. There were been said consensus rather than on clinical trials, no controlled studies. The denominator clearly was changing, particularly with subclinical inf infections. <clears throat> the impact of uh, vaccination and, and Paxlovid was unclear, still is. <clears throat> the assumed stratification was based on the severity of illness. That's not clear to be be valid, but again, it was consensus. And long COVID, I think the, the story is still left to be fully written. There were all sorts of algorithms, <clears throat> and they were um, basically unreadable. <clears throat> um, here's one. Here's another. <clears throat> here's yet another. These were from early on. <clears throat> and the range of guidelines that, that were um, proposed, um, this was uh, perhaps the most helpful one. If somebody's already feeling well and back to, to, to full activity, then you really don't have to, to, to evaluate further. But there were others, um, uh, no activity, no sports activity until two to four weeks after a positive test. 10 days after symptoms, seven days after symptoms disappear, perhaps two weeks after symptom resolution. <clears throat> um, for those hospitalized, not to participate for three to six months, gradual return to activity. <clears throat> Updates <clears throat> um, more recently during this past year. <laughs> that athletes can return to play without further testing once symptoms resolve. 
sounds like common sense. <clears throat> um, latest up, uh, update um, in, um, in some uh, published guidelines <clears throat> that any testing should be reserved only for athletes where the symptoms highly suggestive of myocarditis. Call from Ann Goss, Rod Peckham. Sorry. Ann Goss, Rod Peckham. And um, that individuals with no symptoms or non-cardiopulmonary symptoms may re resume training just three days after <clears throat> after um, after uh, infection without additional uh, testing, although they should continue to follow self-isolation guidelines. So now we're down to, to three days from, from days or weeks. Uh, this uh, very recently, the CDC uh, included COVID in their guidelines for, for any respiratory virus. And basically, you can go back to normal activities <clears throat> um, and, uh, 24 hours after symptoms are getting better overall and after you've not had a fever. So COVID now falls into the same category as any respiratory illness and certainly is now parallel with influenza. And you can go back to normal activities, but just take um, uh, precautions that we're familiar with for the next five days. So resume activity when you're feeling better and, and, and observe precautions for five days are, 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 are now the, uh, the thoughts. Okay, so how about summarizing those, those um, aspects of uh, the sports physical examination or pre-participation examination. Uh, <clears throat> first, I think we can all agree that primary care providers are frequently asked to perform these, these evaluations. <clears throat> that the goals of these examinations, evaluations are vague, though seem to aim at prevention for preventive screening for heart disease. That seems to be the ultimate worry. And the, and the worry specifically is sudden cardiac death, which despite the way the ways the you know, the press uh, report these events is really quite rare. That tools are available to guide these evaluations. Uh, that the personal and family history, that history is most helpful. Cardiac testing and EKG, if any, though this is somewhat controversial, that is the degree to which recording these EKGs actually is helpful. A uh, little post-COVID restriction at this point in time, except for those who've had advanced disease. And again, as, as, as part of this cautionary theme that I've had through this talk, screening cannot prevent most sports-related cardiac events or identify those at risk. <clears throat> so some recommendations. Uh, sports physical examinations, if you seek to perform them, if you're asked to perform, should emphasize history. An EKG can be performed if history or exam <clears throat> raise any concern. If history raises a concern or if an EKG, if done, is abnormal, that in the referral to a cardi to cardiology would be appropriate. Understand and explain that a normal sports screening process cannot detect most individuals with an elevated risk for acute sports-related cardiac events.
understand and explain that abnormalities identified with screening are frequently false positive. <clears throat> These thoughts perhaps uh, are a bit cynical, but I, I, th I think the the overall message of of the overall content of 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 this presentation justifies these last points. Okay, to <clears throat> like to kind of go back to the questions that we asked at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> Again, to ask you to respond, I, I kind of want to see if any of my messages have, have got through and if this talk is beneficial in performing the these examinations that you often do. All right, so those results okay. are, uh, go. <clears throat> okay, we close that out. And hopefully yes to all, and it seems like um, you folks have responded um, positively for which I'm, I'm thankful. Uh, the, the slide deck which you should have uh, has, um, a number of references, uh, and again, these are clickable, uh, and there, there, there are some that are on the specific slides as as well in context. Uh, these are <clears throat> these are generally here are cardiovascular screening references about sudden death, references about COVID. <clears throat> And hopefully they'll be helpful if, if you want to dig in further. Uh, questions, uh, anything that uh, you'd like to challenge, um, 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 difficulties you, you've had that I perhaps haven't addressed, any and all thoughts? Yeah, so we already have a few questions in the chat. The first question is, in an adolescent, what level of concern should I have for an incomplete RBBB on ECG? As a normal variant, can I clear this for sports or should it always be referred to cardiology? Excellent question. Um, an incomplete right bundle branch block or sometimes uh, an EKG computer interpretation, we'll call it. Um, right ventricular conduction delay, and RSR in V1 is a very common normal variant uh, in, um, in, uh, in children and adolescents. It can come and go. Uh, some have proposed it might relate to variable vagal tone. Uh, it's um, rarely a concern. And if your evaluation is otherwise normal, I would say if you're if according to those forms and and, and checklists, <clears throat> if history and 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 uh, examination is is fine, um, I would ignore it and clear for uh, sports certainly. Uh, I don't think it it requires further testing um, unless there's some other level of suspicion that come from those 14 points or those PPE forms. Uh, that's why they're they're kind of they're kind of helpful, particularly the history, as I've said repeatedly. 
<clears throat> and I would I would uh, say fine for participation um, in in sports, uh, and um, it would not require further testing or referral. Okay, thank you. The next question is: How reliable are automatic reads for the purposes of sports clearance on typical EKG machines? How reliable? Once again, how reliable are automatic reads for purposes of sports clearance on typical EKG machines? The computerized interpretations are 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 good, um, with with two qualifications. First of all, is be sure you're getting a pediatric analysis or analysis of this based on age. <clears throat> um, the uh, frequently I've, I've seen e EKGs as being read uh, by those computer algorithms as being abnormal when there's no age and it's assumed to be an adult, uh, age uh, 40 or 50 or whatever then is there is a drawback. Um, the second is to realize that that they're always going to be conservative, namely, they're going to err on the side of calling something abnormal. Um, and this is where the the, the uh, false positive issue comes in in terms of generating more more cost, time, and energy. <laughs> um, so that uh, an EKG, you know, you get these borderline re readings. Uh, so they're they're pretty good. Um, if um, if the reading has some abnormality to it that that you're not sure represents some sort of a a concern or an impediment, get an overread of the EKG before you start down um, a um, a pathway. Thank you. The next question is, if you have a patient with marfanoid habitus, um, do you direct the patient towards certain physical activities and direct them away from others? If you believe someone might have marfans, uh, there, I, I, would, I would get them a, a, a referral if possible to, to someone who does formal evaluations, um, perhaps genetic testing. There is a there is an evaluation score for Marfans to make it um, more or less likely that um, that they have Marfans. Um, I think I think if you really suspect that or get some some help uh, uh, with with uh, making that diagnosis because it's it, 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 if an individual does have Marfans, it has profound implications going forward for both the individual and the family. There are there is good genetic testing for Marfans. If you really think that someone um, uh, may have that habitus, what is it? Well, there's certainly a tall stature. Usually, these folks are 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 thin. They're not they're not just tall. They have musculoskeletal abnormalities. Um, they have scoliosis. Um, classically, um, they have really um, uh, long, attenuated-looking uh, uh, fingers called arachnodactyly. <clears throat> um, their their uh, wingspan, the extension of their arms, is 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 increased. They stand up um, and put their their uh, arms by their side. Their fingers will come close to their knees. They may have problems with vision, dislocated uh, lenses, uh, a really high arched palate, and then as again going to family history, it's it's uh, usually uh, those who have Marfan's. It's it's genetic. It's it's an autosomal dominant with with a varying expression. Go after uh, history. What are the um, What's the the stature of siblings, of parents, <clears throat> of um, of grandparents? Uh, is is are are there tall individuals who've died young in the family? Go after that family history, uh, and really see the degree to which there's there's additional confirmatory aspects of suspecting somebody has has Marfans and that they're just not tall and skinny. <clears throat> um, Another um, sort of um, 
the thought to pass along is, is usually those with Marfans aren't athletes. They're not good. They're not well coordinated, and they don't they uh, they they don't uh, feel comfortable with physical activity, and you won't find um, uh, many uh, NBA players with Marfans. Um, they they just don't um, um, end up uh, even. Uh, um, um, getting into high levels of, of of activity. So take in the whole picture. Really go after after family history. Um, uh, if you suspect somebody has Marfan's, and if if your suspicion is high, <clears throat> see if you can get a referral, um, a genetics referral, uh, and someone who who commonly addresses and has the tools to follow through. Thank you. The next question is, <clears throat> my understanding is many athletes have physiological murmurs. Do all murmurs require echo or referral um, or is a phys physical exam appropriate for differentiating physiologic versus pathologic murmurs? Thank you. Excellent question. Murmurs and murmur evaluation is actually one of my favorite topics. It, it's kind of hard to do over Zoom. <laughs> but there are a couple of thoughts I can pass along. Um, murmurs in children are common. And if you take some time and listen, you'll hear murmurs on a high percentage of your patients. <laughs> this means um, uh, putting the stethoscope next to the skin, not just on top of clothing. It means listening in different areas of, of, of the chest in lying sitting positions and lying on the left hand side when the heart moves closer to the chest wall if if you have a good stethoscope you'll hear murmurs and and a number of your your patients um what an innocent murmur is um is is also helpful right? namely what does it sound like an innocent murmur usually has a vibratory or musical quality. It has a sort of sound. It's 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 not um, uh, um, harsh or raspy, and it's variable. Um, and uh, one of the most helpful characteristics is is that. When your patient stands up, it goes away. So a vibratory sound that uh, is um, um, that's present lying or sitting and disappears with standing is likely to be a an innocent murmur or a flow sound. These sounds uh, actually by echocardiography, when one matches them up, are, are, are most commonly due to, to, a, to a very thin <clears throat> and, uh, and delicate structure in the heart vibrating and actually causing a sound like a, like a string on a musical instrument. <clears throat> so that's kind of helpful, um, particularly if you hear it one visit and it's gone the next visit. <clears throat> And it has these uh, characteristics and, and positional uh, variances. Uh, I think will 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 certainly help. Um, from my point of view, um, if there's a murmur, for me, listening to it is more helpful than an echocardiogram. You probably had the experience where you referred somebody for an echocardiogram because they have a murmur, and the echocardiogram comes back as being normal. And then you sort of say, well, okay, what was I hearing? So um, if um, if it's possible um, to, if, if you're really concerned, a cardiology referral um, for someone who's experienced to listen to the sound and let them decide whether an echocardiogram is needed. Because an echocardiogram can, can be uh, expensive, it can take time. Um, to to uh, to to get if your patient is is uninsured the 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 cost is is excessive 
and much more than having someone else who's experienced listen to the stethoscope. But it's a good question. Murmurs are common in children. They're most often innocent murmurs and <clears throat> vibratory in quality, variable in position. Thank you. The next question is, my preceptor said another point of these exams is to prove normal health so that TSSAA will cover the care in case injury sustained during participation. Is this true? Well, I'm not sure, but it's an example of, of somebody asking for an evaluation, not for the health of the patient, but for some other reason. What was that abbreviation? Who would, who would be looking for it? E-S-S-A-A. -S -S -A. I don't know what that is. Um, I'm not either. I can do a quick Google search. <clears throat> well, well, certainly, I, I, I sort of made that point in the talk, you know, for whom are these evaluations? Um, and, um, and and keep in mind that that sort of cynical thread that you can do these evaluations, but your chances of of really finding and identifying a a, a disease or a high risk for participation in sports is really tiny. Um, it's a lot of effort, um, and you're asked to do it. Then there are good tools to do it. But your chances over the course of of your professional life of actually identifying somebody who who has one of these rare forms of of, of heart disease is is pretty low, and there's a good chance that you'll clear somebody. Um, there's just as good a chance that you'll clear somebody um, who will have an event later on, since most of these conditions <laughs> aren't. Uh, are identified even with the best of intent. So yes, we do these, but we're not sure for whom we do them. Uh, it's a, it's a bit of a cynical thread, but keep in mind that um, you know exactly what it is that you're looking for, you know, the degree to which you're going to be successful, <clears throat> and 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 the fact that that dis despite all the good intentions of wanting. And to identify who's at risk and prevent these events, that um, that the uh, the risk is small and the chance of identifying that risk is small. Thank you. Uh, we do have some raised hands. I'm going to um, allow a few providers to talk here. So, um, Hal, you are up first. <clears throat> uh did you say how monsieur yes i was just going to say that the uh the tssaa is and i think someone else had put in the chat that it's the agency or association organization for high school sports so this is what uh is required by the state for people to participate in high school sports okay great I, I'm, I'm sure you know if 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 they you know they can make their their recommendations and you can respond and they'll feel happy that someone is 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 cleared um the data certainly are are undeniable um uh in the degree to which uh, this is helpful it maybe takes them off the hook but the the reduction of risk i think is is more institutional than it is for the individual thank you Okay, I see uh, Mary Cahill has her hand up too, so I have muted you as well. Do you she's still have a question, Mary? She's muted. Um, I can't unmute her. She has to unmute. Um, oh, there we go. Oh, her microphone is broken. Okay. Um, feel free to type your question into the chat or into the Q&A. And then in the meantime, I see the last hand raised is Laura Green. I'm going to allow you to talk as well. So go ahead with your question, Laura. I'm sorry, I, by 
did not mean to raise my hand. I must have bumped something. Okay. Um, then while we still have a few minutes, let's go back to one of the questions that are in the chat. Um, I wasn't even, my hand wasn't even on. Sorry. Um, so another question here is, can you send a patient with suspected Marfan to cardiology as a first step? If you don't have genetics um, um, available, um, I think you can refer to cardiology. Um, certainly a cardiologist in, in, is in, in um, addition to evaluating those elements of, of history and exam that I mentioned, can listen uh, really well for for any um, uh, <clears throat> for any um, abnormal sounds. Uh, pe uh, patients with Marfan's can have mitral valve prolapse and mitral regurgitation. So certainly, to be able to listen for for that sound and be able to characterize it uh, and differentiate from an innocent murmur, and an echocardiogram is helpful. Um, patients with Marfan's can have cardiac abnormalities. Um, the most uh, fearful is 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 um, do, uh, is is a dilated aorta um, due to weakness of the um, of of the blood vessel wall, aortic aneurysms, uh, and dissection. For those truly have Marfan's, is a high risk, and to uh, and and to look at other heart structures. Um, um, Mitral valve prolapse, as I mentioned, uh, this is real mitral valve prolapse with a, with a a uh, structurally abnormal mitral valve as well as the leakage, <clears throat> and to um, look for some other abnormalities. Some will have an atrial septal defect. So, for, so I th I think if cardiology is the specialty that you have more available, I think that would be a good a good referral if your suspicion based on history and exam is elevated. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Mary Cahill typed her uh, statement or question into the chat, and it's about Kevin McHale, a Celtics player. Um, does he have Marfan syndrome? No. No, but he 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 certainly had long arms. <laughs> there was there was no question about that. <laughs> all all of the NBA players, I I I, I did see some commentary once uh, uh, undergo extensive. Um, uh, medical screening and particularly cardiovascular screening, they all have echocardiograms um, uh, and uh, stress tests and, uh, and, and rhythm monitoring um, as a matter of course. And they have this screening. Be I, th I think they all undergo this some of this stuff before the draft so that the teams um, can... Uh, can um, uh, <clears throat> Um, can uh, uh, appropriate throw their resources at them. Um, a, a couple of thoughts that there was a player who played for the Boston Celtics as well as other teams called Pete Maravich, Pistol Pete Maravich, who died suddenly and had an anomalous coronary artery. But it wasn't until late in his athletic career that that he got into trouble and so so he played basketball for years he um he held the the co collegiate uh, scoring record um i i i heard until broken uh, this past week by by um by uh, uh, uh one of the women's um collegiate basketball stars so, and it was ironic that that came up because uh, he was one of the few. Um, there was a uh, another um, basketball player who died suddenly, played for the Celtics, uh, uh, Reggie Lewis, um, and um, and he had a cardiomyopathy, and they knew about it, and and buried it, and um, so he had heart disease, which was which was um, identifiable um, and uh, and it may have been drug related. Another uh, basketball player who died suddenly, um, again, a Celtics player, Len Bias, he never played, but he was drafted. Um, he died because of cocaine. If you remember drugs was one of those reasons for sudden death. Um, and he was he was a a, a cocaine user. Um, so you know, these events and everybody's concerned about them. Uh, 
and um, uh, they, certainly those who get to those um, <clears throat> uh, uh, um, high levels of of uh, academic performance and professional sports, they get they get screened and evaluated, um, just like that that football player who who had cardiac arrest on the field. He had had extensive um, cardiovascular evaluation before before he uh, entered the uh, the NFL. Interesting. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Angoff. We are at time. Um, <clears throat> so the CME surveys, please complete those, and then the certificates will be deployed. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel, to, feel free to email Kristen Talbot. Um, and again, Dr. Angoff, thank you so much for your time. This was a great talk. Thank you, everybody, for, for listening and participation. Your questions are great. All right. Have a good afternoon, everybody.